Jai Prabhuji. Hello and welcome once again to our course where we are exploring the book of Prabhuji, Kundalini Yoga, The Power Is In You. In our last class, we began the, the journey to explore the Anya Chakra, the sixth center or the third eye where our intuition resides. This chakra is connected to our sixth sense, like a, a new eye awakening, symbolizing enlightenment and also an elevation of consciousness. Let's remember that it's just one step before the union of Shakti with Shiva in the Sahasrara. So as the penultimate step before the dissolution of what we believe ourselves to be, the subtlety will be noticeable now that we're going to begin discussing its properties. So that's what we're going to do today. We're going to be sharing and delving into the different properties of this center. We'll notice how in comparison to the others below it, this energy center lacks a subtle element, a jnanendriya or karmendriya. And this is, as I just mentioned, due to the subtlety of the center. Without further delay, let's delve, delve into the understanding more the significance of its name. The word Anya means order, command or authority. And an alternative meaning is unlimited power. And pay attention to these uh, meanings of the name, command, order, uh, authority. We're going to see it in a few more minutes. What is the element that is related to this center? And then everything is going to make even more sense when we explain about it. Among the alternative names, we find Admanetra, which is the eye of the soul, Triyanetra, the third eye, Shiva Netra, the eye of Shiva. Then in the tantric terminology, this chakra is known by the following names. Anya Patra, the invisible leaf. Anya, the authority or unlimited power. Anya Pura, the powerful city. I don't know if you remember when we did our classes in regards to the Manipura and we saw the meaning of the name we saw that pura means city so now anya pura is going to be the powerful city then in the vedas and the upanishads they are also going to refer to the center as anya and another name will be a uh, vaindava stana which is the place of the almighty bru bruhu yuga madhya villa the pit situated at the junction of the eyebrows Bruhu Chakra, the eyebrow chakra, and Div Dala, the two petal one. And then in the Puranic terminology, it is known as Anya, Dividal, and Tri Rashna, which is the three part one. Remember that we just took a few from the many that are mentioned in this section of the book. And something that for me was very interesting about the alternative names is that it is also called the Guru Chakra. And this is due to the connection with the planet Jupiter with this center. The name of Jupiter in Sanskrit is Guru. So through this center, the disciple is going to receive part of the guidance from the spiritual master. As we learn, in the past in our classes where we were speaking about the awakening ascending and, descend and descending of the kundalini shakti we saw that one of the ways of awakening the kundalini was through shakti path or initiation uh, we saw many others we saw that uh, we can do it through mantras we can do it uh, through austerities we can do it with certain practices sadhana of the kundalini but we saw also how the one of the easiest one is the association with an enlightened being so um uh, the master the enlightened being is going to put it's usually put in the thumb in the third eye and it can um, produce induce the awakening of the kundalini in this part 
in regards to what I just said, it's worth remembering so also that as I mentioned about the awakening of the Kundalini, that reciprocity is necessary. Many wonder if only the only necessary thing for the awakening of the Kundalini is the presence of the master. But as we have learned, the disciples accessibility is important. As this famous saying from the East goes, the master appears when the disciple is ready. And I've heard Prabhuji mention this phrase frequently. And it speaks about our attitude as disciples and obviously his, because despite being a master, he remains a disciple forever. In order to be a master, first you need to be a disciple. And as a master, you remain a disciple for eternity. So he's telling us when he brings up this phrase, one of many things that we can learn from it is that we must focus in cultivating the disciple in us, not on seeking a master who meets certain requirements, who is in certain way, etc., but to trust in the existence that when I will be ready as a disciple, then the guru is going to appear. Continuing with more properties in regards to the center, we have that the location of it is in the pituitary gland, uh, which we are going to speak about more, more about later. And the keshetram of the center is in the center of the eyebrow, between the two eyebrows. I wanted to talk more about what the jantra of the center symbolizes. And as I'm showing you some images, we see these two petals, and then we have this circle in the middle that unites them. So when I see this, and it's explained also how there is here occurs like a union, a fusion, where uh, before the center they were opposites now they're going to become complementary so we have like the two sides of the same coin we have the sun and the moon the feminine and the masculine and we have for example the nadis the ida and pingala in this center these two nadis are becoming united and from there they go upwards they ascend towards the Sahasrara Chakra in the Shushumna Nadi. So this is the last place where they are fusionating and then going ascending to the Sahasrara Chakra. The deity that is representing, speaking about complementary, the deity that is representing this center is Arda Narishwara, which is precisely the union or synthesis of Shiva and Shakti. And as we can visualize in the image that I'm going to present, on the Shiva side, it's going to be blue, and then on the Shakti is pink, and he's holding a trident, which is a representation of triads, like the material, astral, and causal plane, or the three modalities, which are Satwa, Rajas, and Tamas. And Shakti is holding a lotus which symbolizes purity. So here again we have this representation of the fusion that occurs in this center. The goddess that is presiding the Anya is Hakini. She has six heads and six arms she is seated on a lotus flower and her skin it says that it's very beautiful pink color she's adorned with beautiful golden jewelry and precious stones as is our custom i would like us to read the paragraph the verse that we find in the satchakra nirupana in regards to hakini and we read the lotus called anya is like the moon beautifully white. On its two petals are the letters Ha and Kasha, which are also white and enhance its beauty. It shines with the glory of Dhyana, meditation. Inside it is the Shakti Hakini, whose six faces are like as many moons. She has six arms. In one of them she holds a book. 
to others are raised in gestures of dispelling fear and granting wishes. And with the rest, she holds a school, a small drum, and a rosary. Her mind is pure, Sudashita. And we find this verse in the Satchakra Nirupana eh, by Swami Purnanananda. This is the verse number 32. The element or tattoo of this center is the mind or manas. And this is what I was mentioning. I want to explain it first and then we can uh, go back to the meaning of the name of this center. What I would like us to do is to read the paragraph, the exact paragraph that we find in the book. And from there, we're going to comment on it. The element of the frontal center is the mind, which constitutes the center of knowledge when it's focused on the relative and material but which becomes the source of wisdom when it is internalized and merged. The mind is more than just a simple processor of sensory information. As we have shared in various occasions, it is divided into manas, shita, buddhi, and ahankara. This structure reveals a more complete and nuanced view of mental functioning. Manas acts as the receptor of sensory impressions, channeling them to chitta, which is the storehouse of perceptions, knowledge, and ideas. Buddhi, the intellect, then intervenes and discern and assign value or identity to these perceptions. And finally, Ahankara is responsible for personal identification with those perceptions, declaring, This is mine. It's going to uh, adjudicate everything that this that manas perceives and pass through um, chitta and uh, buddhi and it's going to say this is mine this is my chair this is my my table or it's always a situation concerning me the, this functional view that we just described focuses on the mind's interaction with the external world. However, when the mind's attention is directed inward, a process of introspection begins that can transform that perception and what we know. So instead of accumulating knowledge from external sources, it is thought in the depth of being, where innate wisdom resides and can be discovered so in my humble opinion this is like a 180 degree a turn a an introspective turn which is fundamental to understanding the mind not only as an instrument of perception and external processing as we just described but as a source of internal wisdom let's remember that this center is related to the intuition so of course then there is another functions that the mind can perform not only with the external reality but there is something that happens when the attention turns to our to the depths of our being and while I'm saying this war, I recall a lecture of Prabhuji where he talks about majeutics. And this method is based on the idea that wisdom is not acquired externally, but emerges from within each individual. Socrates, which is the one that developed this method, it's very famous, but was inspired by his mother profession. She is a midwife midwife so uh, what he did is that he applied this principle to knowledge believing that his role was only to help people to give birth to truth that already resided within them through a method of questioning and using also irony he encouraged the different students to discover answers for for themselves so again the truth resides in the person, it resides in us, and in this method of the majeutic, uh, Socrates uh, saw himself 
only as a mediator, as a medium for the person to discover the wisdom that it's already in them. And I'm using specifically the word wisdom and not knowledge. Um, remembering also what we find in the book Advaita Vedanta here in that book, Prabhupada is giving us a very clear explaining the difference between these two terms, knowledge and wisdom. And one of them was exactly what we are just explaining now, how knowledge is something that we acquire from the exterior. It's an external process that we acquire from uh, others. And then wisdom is something that is born from the depths of our being, from our interior, if we can call it this way. And um, I feel very much that this process of introspection where our attention turns inward is fostering a, an attitude of acceptance, which is crucial for any type of development. If we focus only on all the obstacles that the mind could present, and for me it was important to make this parenthesis because many times we refer to the mind as this thing that it's this storage that uh, saves our memories our preconceived ideas here we have what we believe ourselves to be and we can fall in what i say it will be the mistake of just focusing in that specific part of the mind but as we are learning now it's i can say it can be a tool that can obviously help us in the realization of what we are i read not long ago also in the book advaita vedanta jnana yoga how it's using the mind as a tool as an instrument to understand its own limitation. So instead of discarding it, disregarding it, uh, rejecting it, or even uh, not accepting its existence, it's saying, this is a wonderful tool, let's use it in order to even understand our cognitive processes. But at the same time, it was clarifying how it is not like a, f a philosophical search, but it's more a self-inquiry, what we call self-inquiry. So continuing with the view of the mind, um, I will say that if we only focus in the obstacles, because yeah, the mind comes with cer certain obstacles and it's important to, to see them. But if we only focus on those, we will inhibit ourselves from seizing all that uh, the mind can offer, that life offers us. For some reason, we, w we have this. And then when we go to that attitude of acceptance, of opening, then we can definitely more uh, take advantage of what it's offered to us. Um, when we take certain distance and we do not judge, having this openness, uh, as we discuss also in different of our classes, is going to allow us a more holistic and more enriching view of existence. And I will say also, there is a more integral view because we're not seeing things with conflict and contradictions and separating, right? This is what conflict uh, causes, this separation. But when we can see uh, things in a more with distance and with more clarity then we can seize all these things that uh, life can offer us the color of the chakra is indigo and then i would like to mention all the properties that comparing to the other centers this this one does not have the color of the tatua there isn't we just spoke about the tatua mm. Before I forget, 
what I wanted to say in regards to the mind is how um, we see the name, the meaning of the name Anya, which was the authority, order or command. And it's because of the power that the mind has. Uh, we saw in our previous class, it's a verse that I really, it's one of the, the one of my favorite verses of the Bhagavad Gita, the one uh, of Vandurat uh, Manatmanastasya Jenat Mai Vatmanajitaha Anatmanastu Chatutre Arte Tratmai Vashatruvate, which is telling us how for the one that had that has conquered the mind, it's the best of friends, but for the one that hasn't, then it will remain the worst of enemies. So again, it's showing us the power of the mind and how when we conquer it, it can become a, the best of our friends, if not remains the worst. And here we see it one more time when there is a turn of the perception of the mind not to see only the external in order to acquire knowledge but to turn to the depths of our being and where wisdom can be born as i said no color of the tatua then there is no sense organ or nyanendriya also there is no organ of action or karmendriya subtle element or tamatra none the vile element or dosha also none but uh, there is a power associated with the center which is the ability to enter another body and also the acquisition of mystical powers and it makes sense because the center is related to the intuition we've been speaking about a sixth sense a third eye that it's open that it's awakened so then this is why uh, the power that is related to this center is going to be this acquisition of different mystical uh, abilities mystical powers the animal uh, of the chakra is the black gazelle the gazelle it's going to be characterized by its agility the speed this ability to move with grace and precision it's in its environment and in different traditions the black gazelle symbolizes focus and conscious mind that is going to be then capable of perceiving reality and clarity uh, with clarity and penetration so we have this animal which is very agile it's very fast and it's very precise and then it's going to translate in these different capabilities that can happen with the mind. The black color may suggest the depths and the darkness of the inner perception, as well as the ability to see beyond the superficial appearances and access the truth that lies within us. We have the plane or the loka, which is tapa or tapa loka. It's the plane of austerity, this uh, word in Sanskrit that we mentioned a few times, tapasya. Then uh, this is going to be the plane of this center. The gland, it's the pituitary, which is also called the hypothesis. It is, uh, I think it's also besides the thyroid i think it's one of the most famous ones it's the ones that i hear the most um, and it's because even though it's very small it's very powerful it's part of course of the endo endocrine system and it's going to be located at the base of the brain just behind the nasal bridge and behind the third eye so it's going to coincide with the physical location that is associated with the Anya Chakra. And this gland is extremely important for the endocrine system as it's going to regulate and it's going to control the release of key hormones that affect a wide variety of bodily functions. It's going to include growth, metabolism, reproduction, the balance of water and electrolytes. And as we have seen in relation to the glands in the previous centers, the balance 
of the center itself, it's going to directly influence the proper functioning of the gland that is associated with it. And it's not different here. Uh, the functioning or the balance on the center is going to influence the functioning of the pituitary gland. The energy channel or nadi is Ida and Pingala. In this a specific center, Ida and Pingala fusionate and then they go, they ascend or go towards the, the Sahasrara from the Shushuda, Shushumna Nadi, from the Shushumna Nadi. So here, as I mentioned earlier, they fusionate and then go towards the Sahasrara. Um, in the Shushumna Nadi. The vital air or Vaju, we're going to see that are the Pancha Pranas, which are the major Pranas. It's Prana, Apana, Viana, Samana, and Udana. So it's not one Prana as we saw in the previous center that one of these was uh, assigned to the previous centers, but these ones, uh, this one has all of them. And this is another uh, like I think it's telling us even more about the subtlety of the center, how it compromises all the all the pranas, all the vital airs. The envelope or kosha is going to be vinyana maya kosha, which is the intellectual envelope or sheath. The stones are aquamarine, amazonite, a pirate, turquoise, amethysts, jade and others you can find more in the book the aroma of the center is jasmine the aromatherapy oils are mint violet vetiver patchouli rosemary and more the planet or graha is sunny or saturn and the secondary chakras that are related to it to mention a few are Bisma Lokana, Dridihi, Yama Vagani, Yama Kanta, Yasha, Manotiga, and many more. This is everything for today. In our next class, we are going to be delving into the correct or incorrect functioning of the center. And what I mean by that is if the center is balanced or unbalanced. We are going to see how the functioning of it is going to affect us not only physically but also mentally and emotionally. We are going to see the different symptoms that can occur when it's functioning correctly and when it has a deficit or when it's overloaded. Thank you so much for joining us today. Jai Prabhuji.